Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Janine Turner, founder and co-president of Constituting America. Welcome to our show today. We've been doing this for over a year. So thanks for joining us. We're thrilled that you're with us um, for our constitutional chats, co-hosted by Kathy Gillespie, Tova Love Kaplan, and Julian Jordan Gilbert. So we're thrilled you're here with us. We have a we have a great topic today. It's about God and natural law. Um, our, one of our taglines has been, um, in God we trust, but do we? <laughs> That's the question. Um, but natural law is really the discussion today, which is, is, is becoming um, sort of tucked away in, in our minds and there's, as a society, it's sort of on the back of the filing cabinet, and it really shouldn't be because it's paramount to the future of our country and to our rights. And we have a very special guest with us today. Gary Porter, and I'm going to introduce him in just a little bit, and as well as Aubrey, who's a member of our fabulous team. Um, first, please tell us who you are, how old you are at least. So Aubrey, if you would like to tell us the results, take that down now and tell us the results of the poll, and we can see, you can say hi to everyone. Yes, hello everyone. I'm excited to share these results. So we have 3% elementary school students, 3% middle and high school students, 26% of parent and grandparents with children, 16% donors, 3% family, 35% friends, and 10% fans. And we're so grateful that all of you are here to tune in for this wonderful podcast today. Great. Awesome. Thrilled you're here. We like fans of the United States Constitution. <laughs> we're fans of the United States Constitution. You know what I always like to say? When a Democrat's in office, Republicans love the Constitution. When a Republican's in office, Democrats love the Constitution. Everyone loves the Constitution when they want to restrain power. And that's why we love the Constitution, because it restrains power and protects our rights. My mother always wants to know what that halo is around me. It's just a halo. You see my halo? Not really. It's a virtual background. Okay, I'm going to introduce everybody else. Tova Love Kaplan. Tova is such an extraordinary young woman. She never ceases to amaze me. And she knows how special it is when I say that. And we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled that she's here. She's the National Youth Director for, I think we have a photo of her, there you go, of uh, Constituting America, which she runs like a top CEO of a top 100 company. She speaks Arabic. And I think last week she told us she speaks French and many other languages. She's truly amazing. And um, you're going to see her someday as Secretary of State or the President of, uh, Representative for the, at the UN. Whatever she chooses to be, she will accomplish. And she runs our National Youth Board. She's also won our contest three times, left and right brain. First was entrepreneurial, then it was public service announcement, directing a commercial, which was artistic, and then back to creating an app. So she's truly extraordinary. Trouble love, Kathleen, say hello. Thank you so much, Kathy, I mean, uh, and Janine for having me on. And thank you, Janine, for that amazing introduction. I'm so happy to be here. Can't believe we've been doing it for over a year. Um, my quarantine would definitely not be nearly as exciting without it. And I feel like I've come out of this knowing so much more about the Constitution, and I hope all of you have too. Um, and I'm excited to get into this topic. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tova. Kathy, oh my gosh, sorry. I skipped over the actual, you know, I'm the, fine. the, the star of the foundation. We wouldn't exist without our Kathy Gillespie co-president. Kathy Gillespie is my dear best soulmate friend in the world. She's like a soul sister. She's co-president of Constituting America. She's one of the 16 private citizens serving on the U.S. Semi-Quincentennial Commission, helping to organize the celebration of our country's 250th birthday in 2026. Um, Kathy is the former chief of staff on the Hill and the former commissioner on the President's Commission of White House Fellows. And we like to say, uh, in order to get Constituting America, we're like a bird. It takes a left wing and a right wing to fly. And that's what 
Kathy and I are, the right wing, the left wing, but without our donors, we wouldn't have the, the wind beneath our wings. We wouldn't even get off the ground, right, Kathy? So Kathy is going to say hello and tell us about today's sponsor. Well, thank you, Janine, and I'm always honored to follow Tova, so that's not a problem. Um, we want to thank our sponsors today, Dan and Ann Renzel, who are just some great community volunteers and leaders in Alexandria, Virginia. Dan is a member of our leadership board, and Dan and Ann have been supporting us for many years. And Dan and Ann, we thank you so much for sponsoring today's segment of Constitutional Chats. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, so much, Dan and Ann. How cool, Dan and Ann. I like that. It's always fun when things like that happen. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. All right, Jewel and Doran Gilbert, our other co-host. Extraordinary, extraordinary young man. We're thrilled to have them on. They're just getting extraordinarily fabulous reviews. Um, Jewel, and jo Jewel is the executive producer and Joran is the operations director of Sing for America, a family-based company that they both co-founded. Sing for America seeks to show the art and the art of truth and light, capital T and capital L, through life, live performance. Both are proud former We the People contest winners. Yes, and we're proud of them too. Just they've just they've just a, they're a light for our foundation. We're thrilled to know them. Sing for America is an actor-run theater company which specializes in semi-professional musicals, private training in the arts, school drama solutions, and public entertainment events all while revealing a colorblind world stage. Jewel and Jordan just recently graduated from Moravian College where they earned a BA in musical performance and dramatic production. They're so extraordinary. Welcome to the show, Jewel and Jordan. Happy to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're thrilled to hear. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll, please. We are now going to I'm going to introduce our extraordinary guest today. And look at that background for a minute. I was actually fooled. I'm like, oh, that looks like independent. Oh, that is Independence Hall. Um, Gary Porter is executive director of the Constitution Leadership Initiative, CLI, a project to promote a better understanding of the U.S. Constitution by the American people. CLI provides seminars on the Constitution, including one for young people utilizing our Constitution rocks as the text. My daughter actually uh, wrote that book, so that's kind of exciting. Gary presents talks on various constitutional topics, writes periodic essays published on several different websites, and appears in period costumes at James Madison. I have witnessed this. It's amazing. Explaining to public and private school students his, in uh, Madison's, role in the creation of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Gary can be reached at gary at constitutionleadership.org on Facebook or Twitter, and Twitter is at Constitution Led. Gary Porter, you also have you've written uh, essays for our 90 day study. And I just wanna say welcome to the show. I love the essay that you wrote. We can take that down now, Aubrey, thank you so much. Um, I love the essay you wrote, Endowed by Their Creator, The Declaration of Independence and Unalienable Rights. You can go to constitutingamerica.org. We have our um, 90 and 90 equals 180, history holds the key to the future. Uh, annual essay um, program happening right now and you can read Gary's essay and essays and uh, they're truly truly terrific and this one was so good I said Kathy we must and we must have Gary as our guest today so Gary thank you so much for joining us on this very very intriguing topic of God and natural law well, thanks, Janine. Yes, it is an intriguing uh, topic, and thank you once again for the opportunity to uh, talk about it. Just even talking about it is uh, very enticing to me because uh, it is an important topic, and it's one that uh, a lot of Americans don't know about. Uh, so let's let's dig into it. Uh, this comes up, of course, because uh, the Constitution of America chose the Declaration of Independence this year as their 90-day study topic, and the Declaration is perhaps America's preeminent natural law document. Jefferson, of course, believed in natural law, as did every one of the founding fathers that I've studied, and that's uh, many of them. Uh, many, many of them spoke and wrote about the topic. The Declaration is also a very natural topic for people interested in the Constitution. In an 1897 case, the Supreme Court de declared that while the Constitution is the body and letter of our government, the Declaration of Independence is the thought and the spirit of that same government. 
More than 100 Supreme Court opinions mention the Declaration in the opinion, and the Constitution itself points to the Declaration by saying in Article 7 that it was signed in the 12th year of the independence of the United States of America. If you want to explore the connection between these two lovely documents further, I highly recommend a book entitled The Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution and What We Risk by Losing It by Dr. Larry Arn of Hillsdale College. So yes, I understand my invitation today is based on uh, my 90 day study where I took on that immortal phrase, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So let's pick the phrase apart a bit and see where that leads us. Jefferson is, of course, referring to not just any God, but the God of the Bible as, quote, their creator, unquote. A lot of people think today think that Jefferson was a deist, and perhaps he was towards the end of his life. But when he wrote these words in 1776, he was as orthodox a Christian as anyone else in colonial America. Now, one of the problems natural law faces today is that many Americans have simply abandoned faith. 90% of Americans still say they believe in God, but only 50% of them view God as an active participant in their life. Only 40% of Americans believe God actually created the world, and fewer still believe Jefferson's words in the Declaration that our natural rights are God-given. The majority of Americans will say that our rights come from government. In a famous interview on CNN, Chris Cuomo berated Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Roy Moore by saying, our rights don't come from God, Your Honor, and you know that, unquote. That, well, that would have been news to John F. Kennedy, who in his inaugural address said, quote, the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God, unquote. So those who believe in natural law had their work cut out for them. If your rights come from government, they can't possibly be unalienable. The same government that gave them to you today can take them from you tomorrow. That's not to say government can't create rights, they occasionally do. Voting, for instance, is a civil right, not a natural right. In a hypothetical state of nature there, where there is no society as yet, voting would not exist, it would have no meaning. So voting can only be a civil right created by civil government and it is clearly alienable. So back to Mr. Jefferson. In referring to natural law as the source of the colonist authority to declare their independence, he uses the phrase laws of nature and nature's God. Well, there's two ways to interpret this phrase, and I prefer this reading, laws of nature and laws of nature's God. In other words, Jefferson is describing two sets of laws here, and Sir William Blackstone, I think, would agree with me. In his commentaries on the laws of England, he described the difference this way, quote, Divine providence, in compassion to the frailty, the imperfection, and the blindness of human reason, hath been pleased at sundry times and in diverse manners to discover and enforce its laws by an immediate and direct revelation. The doctrines thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law, and they are to be found only in the Holy Scriptures. Put in modern language and reading between Blackstone's lines a bit, I think he's saying this. God, seeing that mankind's ability to discern natural law by reason alone, which became flawed, we know as Bible believers, by sin in the Garden of Eden, decided to pull a portion of natural law out of the shadows, so to speak, and reveal it to us in the Bible. Of course, the best example of this is the Ten Commandments. According to this idea, the Ten Commandments were originally part of natural law, but God revealed these moral laws to us by inscribing them on two stone tablets. So we couldn't say, well, I'm so, sorry, officer, I didn't know that was the law. Scripture goes further to tell us that the moral law is even, quote, written upon our hearts, unquote, and it is uh, written on our consciences. And we thus have no excuse not to know it. Which reminds me of another of author J. Bud Zuzeski's wonderful books entitled, What We Can't Not Know. And I know we're going to look at one of his books in the uh, book report shortly, so I'm anxious to, see, to uh, take part in that. Let me conclude my opening remarks by discussing the relationship between natural law and civil law. And turning once again to Blackstone, who wrote, This law of nature is, of course, superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over all the globe, in all countries, and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this and such of them as are valid derive all their force, all their authority from this original. Something similar was said by British parliamentarian Edmund Burke, quote, 
There is but one law for all, namely that law which governs all law, the law of our creator, the law of humanity, justice, equity, the law of nature and of nations, unquote. Based on these remarks, we can conclude that no man-made law is valid or has authority if it contradicts God's natural law or his moral law. This includes Supreme Court rulings to which the American people have given the force of law. So this much should be clear. Natural law exists today as it has since uh, it was created by God. We ignore natural law at our peril, yet the average American knows nothing of it. So our task ahead is clear. We must educate. So let's see if there's any questions. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was um, OK. I, I have uh, so much to to uh, review <laughs> before I toss it to everyone. Um, I want to go back down to this this um, one in 10 Americans believe there's no God at all. All right. Only about 50 percent of Americans believe is a God, an active participant in their lives. That's that's low really half of americans believe god is an active participant in their lives uh 40 of americans believe god actually created the world as jefferson Lu oh see there you go with the big bang theory kind of impeding you know we got to find that combination of science and, and faith that doesn't extinguish each other you know they can, we need to have that we need to have science and faith complement each other instead of extinguishing each other but it looks like it's only 60% of Americans believe God actually created the world. That's interesting. Um, and fewer still believe in the existence of God-given rights. Um, some today claim there's a danger in insisting that rights come from God. Instead, these people insist that, that rights come from human progress. Okay, so that, that's what you write here. And we were talking last week uh, with Professor Nippreth about the philosophers, Aristotle, so to speak, and natural law. And he said this wonderful thing I'm going to reiterate, man is the measure of all things by Protagoras, Protagoras, right. And Plato reinterpreted that man is the measure of all, <laughs> Aubrey's laughing at me, <laughs> man is the measure of all things. We have, to, we have to be careful that we don't do that because we're so infallible as human beings. We all know, the, I would hate to be the barometer of right and wrong. And why men would want to think we are the barometers of right or wrong is sort of uh, incomprehensible, incomprehensible to me because I don't even understand why people would think that. And yet we do. We, we, we now, I think, are, are very, we're living in a society where we think we know what's best. And that goes to human progress. So let me ask you my first question. First of all, tell us what Blackstone's book is. Can you just tell us the title of Blackstone's book? Well, yes, it's a uh, four volume book. Uh publication called Commentaries on the Laws of England, and you can find it today on uh, Amazon and other places. Uh, it is a, an extensive read, but uh, during the time it was uh, published in the mid-1700s, uh, Madison, for one, said Blackstone is in every hand. That is, it was uh, sold as much in the colonies as it was back in England. Hmm. We just need to make a nice, a really good Netflix series based on Blackstone, and then the youth would know it, <laughs> right? That's I can't it. see, other, other than Jewel and Jordan Tova, they will read it, and Aubrey will read it, but the, the majority of, of youth in America are not going to sit down and read that, so, but if we made it a really cool Netflix series, it would be a hit. Um, well, at least it would be watched and learned. All right, so my, my question to you is, Instead, these people insist that rights coming from human progress. What does that mean uh, when, when, when we are, we're, we're, this is the battle. Are we gonna base our, our laws and, and the Supreme Court has done this majority of time, as you just said, are we gonna base our laws on the fact that an inherent goodness and, and uh, moral compass comes from God who gives us our rights? Or are we going to say, actually, it's all just big bang, happened out of nothing, and we are truly the ones in charge here on earth. Is that what human progress means? Well, the problem with that stance is that uh, if you accept it, then you're also buying into the statement that man is a highly evolved creature and is still evolving. So if uh, human progress is evolving, man is evolving, then our rights are in a way are evolving if they are just part of being human. That means there's no inherent or uh, inalienable rights that are immutable, unchangeable. 
that all of our rights have to be accepted as they may be different tomorrow if we are in fact uh, evolving as this creature. Mm -hmm. So right. if we, I'm going to turn over to talk. Yeah, yeah, if we were to put that. Go ahead. What's that? Well, I prefer my rights unalienable. Right. I, so uh, to, to, to apply that to, say, the First Amendment, it would be, well, you have freedom of religion today, but tomorrow it might not be that necessary as humans evolve. We may not need religion at all, you know, which certainly happened yeah. in the Soviet communist. You know, they had the they had to read the book of, you know, the some kind of atheist type of book. Um so we wouldn't, we, that would be frightening to us. Or it's like, well, today you can speak freely on the, but tomorrow you can't. We're really up against that now. Or let's see, the, to, today you can petition the government and tell me what's wrong. But as human, as we progress, no, I don't think it's necessary that you petition the government. Not necessary. We, they know what they're doing. And what's our other one? Assembly. Oh, well, today you can, you have the right to assemble and speak your mind, but later, as human as humanity progresses we're just so evolved why do we need well, to meet it, it fits right in with this living constitution concept you know everything's going to yeah. be different tomorrow because man is the measure of all things which is the dangerous way to look at it exactly i just wouldn't want you know i don't know everybody has their own mindset and this is just my opinion but i certainly wouldn't want my thinking to be the barometer of the measure of all things uh, what what ego would think i am the man who is the measure of all things but of course we know there are egos out there like that <laughs> but I, I think that that's a very dangerous place to be it creates tyranny most and that's the biggest issue here you know yeah we want to have a moral compass and base, but if, if we lose these inalienable rights then we will have a tyrant who says I'm the measure of all things I know best. And it's existed. It's existing now. You've got it in Putin. You've got it in, in China. You have it in North Korea. You have it all over the world. And every continent you have men uh, saying, I am the measure of all things. I know what's best. And that's that's what we fought against. So it's, it's ironic to me that we keep snowballing back to humanity knows what's best when well, that got us into such trouble in the first place. Yep. All right, Tova, you're on. Okay, this is really interesting. Thank you. Um, and okay, I'm gonna be a little bit contrarian and just like just gonna put this out there because I want to see how you respond to this. Um, but so the founding fathers truly believed in natural rights, um, and not in human progress. But at the same time, they lived under a, so a society that protected slavery and didn't seem to believe in the natural rights of black people or even women, but like, especially I'm thinking of like African American people who were slaves and living under this brutal system and the constitution essentially in its creation didn't really apply to them. Um, and so how does, does that challenge the view of natural rights? Does that, does that indicate in any way to you that maybe their conceptions of natural rights were maybe flawed or do you have another way of thinking about it that makes it not a contradiction? Well, I just want to step in. I just want to step in there real quick, Gary, and say that's a really, you know, that's a perspective that I value greatly, and and I I can't wait to hear what Gary has to say about it. But I think when you when you say all founding fathers, we have to be careful with that, right? There 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 were a, a, a handful, but the majority of the founding fathers did not believe that. I mean, Hamilton didn't believe that. They wrote, "I hate to stereotype all founding fathers and people that created our country." It was happening, but it, it certainly wasn't on every founding father. So I just want to go ahead and say that. Go ahead, Gary. Well, Jefferson's a great example because uh, yes, he inherited slaves when his father died, and when he married, uh, inherited some more. But he saw very clearly the discrepancy between what he had written in the Declaration of Independence and what he saw around him. Uh, and he, in, in his only book that he wrote, uh, Notes on the, on the State of Virginia, uh, he makes a remarkable statement, and it's about slavery. And he says, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and his justice will not be stayed forever. Jefferson is saying that, yes, slavery is immoral, unnatural, and 
and all men are in fact created equal. But here we have this slave economy in my state of Virginia. And sooner or later, God is going to bring his judgment on us. That's exactly what he's saying. So yes, they, they saw that there was something wrong with the way they were treating their fellow man, but they were born into this economy. They didn't create it. They were born into it. And, and as they became adults, they looked around and started realizing that this was wrong. But they were willing to um, launch a whole revolution to gain rights for themselves if they truly felt it was wrong and didn't fit with their conception of natural law. Do you think that they would have been that strong about fighting for the rights of their fellow man? I think they were fighting a revolution for everyone in the colonies. I don't. I, I think it's unfair to say they were writing, fighting a revolution for just the founding fathers or just the uh, those who signed the Declaration of Independence. I think they understood these were universal rights of equality that uh, applied to everybody, um, and, and and they wanted to secure their rights from the predations of the British government. They, wanted, they saw that separation was the only way to secure their rights. Uh, so, yes, they were fighting a revolution. They were fighting a revolution for all the individuals in the colonies. And uh, blacks, free blacks, fought on the side of the American colonists in the revolution. Uh, one uh, black man was one of the very first persons killed at Lexington. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very complicated uh, situation, uh, but I think they understood that these rights that Jefferson was elucidating in the Declaration applied to everyone who breathed. Thank you so much. That was a great response. And um, I'm just wondering, just trying to clarify a little more, um, what do you think is the, the issue with the conception that some people say that our rights, that let's say someone who's atheist or something doesn't believe in a God, what do you think is is wrong with them saying, you know, I think our rights are inherent. We're born with our rights. They just not don't necessarily come from God. Maybe all humans just by virtue of being human or by being born inherently have certain rights. Like, how is that different than the conception of natural law coming from God? Could that be considered a form of natural law? If someone doesn't believe in God and just says, by being born human, we have these rights. And, and what do you think of that idea? Well, Scripture tells us that uh, the, the laws of God are written on our hearts, and that doesn't mean just those who believe in the Bible. It means all human beings have this consciousness that there is a moral order to the world. Now, some people will call that inherent to being uh, human, but I would say, and as, as I said it in my essay, that I can see that God was uh, involved in both uh, the, the traditional view that these are God-given rights because uh, God says so, and, and the other view that they're inherent rights. If God wanted them to be known by all individuals, all he had to do was to embed that knowledge and that understanding, that awareness in our DNA, in, our, in, our, in what it means to be a human. So I don't see that uh, a person who says it's, we have an inherent rights uh, as, as being different, really, from someone who says my rights are God-given. They still have the same source, but in one case, God reveals them to us through the Bible. Uh, in the other case, God has embedded them in our being. That's really interesting, yeah. And then just thinking more broadly, um, did the British government that the founding fathers broke away from did they have a conception of natural law or just more broadly, how were like the religious and philosoph uh, philosophical opinions of the British system of government different than the ones that the uh, Americans created? The British had a long history of natural law, uh, understanding and writing about it. Matthew Hale, uh, William Blackstone, John Locke, uh, Thomas Hobbes, there's a whole bunch of British writers who took on the topic of natural law, and, uh, and they had developed it uh, quite extensively before Jefferson sits down in, in June of 1776 to write his uh, lovely document. Uh, so, and, and all these writings by British authors are available on the, on the web. You can download them, uh, or you can buy books, uh, Matthew Hale's book on the law of nature, I've got right sitting in the bookshelf right behind me. 
Uh, and if you want to read their view of natural law, it's, it's largely indistinguishable from what Jefferson has written, and, and, um, and, but much more extensive. So you can explore the British view of natural law because all the documents are out there, easy to obtain, and I encourage you to, to dig in. Janine, you're, oh, there you go. Yeah, I know. I always say that. Tobit, thank you for always bringing a, a yin and yang to uh, juxtaposition to our show, which is the way it should be. Um, we love we love that. We want that, and we encourage that. So thank you, Tova. Uh, Jewel and Jorn, you're on. Okay, so I'll start us off with the with the question that I was pondering by uh, by how you were talking. So many liberal Christians deny natural law. But do you think that it's possible for an intellectual, for an intelligent God to create beings without natural law, meaning that creating beings without a natural driving force in them and almost creating beings without a purpose? Because why would we be here? Is our natural law our purpose? Give us our purpose to strive for. Well, I, I would say to someone who denies that there are natural rights, uh, how did you come to that conclusion? Oh, I just what, heard many. By, by what reasoning? I mean, no, I'm, I'm not talking to you. Oh, okay. I'm, yeah, I got you. I'm having this hypothetical discussion. You know, well, how did you come to the conclusion that there are no natural rights? Well, you used your reasoning, I suppose. Well, where did that reasoning come from? Where did your ability to reason come from? See, there, ultimately, you can drive the conversation back to, is there a God and is or is there not? And if there is a God, then your rights as a creation of that same God are immutable, unchangeable. Would you rather live under an environment where your rights are um, uh, uh, unchangeable? Or would you la rather live in a situation or an environment where your rights are whatever the majority of, the, of your fellow citizens say they are? Uh, whatever 51% says, that, that those are your rights. Now, I would choose to insist that my rights are, in fact, from God. Because, frankly, I don't want 51% of my citizens, uh, my fellow citizens deciding what my rights are. Uh, if in fact they're wrong, then they're making a, an enormous mistake, and, uh, and and I would prefer to argue that my rights are in fact coming from the person who created me. Thank you. Uh, my next question: Do you do you agree that the founders wrote the Declaration and the Constitution when they wrote it that they were? almost trying to capture God's natural law in human words or understanding. Well, I think Jefferson certainly had this in mind because the first challenge they faced as they were declaring their independence was how do we justify this? On what basis do we justify our separating ourselves from the mother country? Well, the only basis that would make sense to someone at any in other any other country in the on the globe would be the basis of natural law because that is the only that was the only common denominator that anyone could point to uh, people in france people in spain people in england germany would all understand if if jefferson is saying based on natural law we have the authority to separate ourselves from great britain everyone would understand his logic because everyone understood uh, natural law in the same way, that it was a, a set of rules that applied to every person and a set of rules for that matter that applied to every nation. We, t we speak of the law of nations. Uh, the Constitution speaks of the law of nations. And, and that is basically natural law applied to nations. So it was a common language, a common understanding. And that's why Jefferson says, based on natural law, we can, in fact, separate ourselves. Okay. And then I just have a, a statement that I would like you to respond to. I just uh, yeah. want to know your thoughts. The struggle of certain people in power to ignore or overthrow natural law is a want by them to pull the center of America from the one God and try to place themselves in a godly position. It is a, it is a thirst for ultimate power which cannot be achieved unless the people place them over God. It's a blaring, 
It's a blaring embodiment of pride in mankind. Just who said go that? ahead and uh, what are your said, thoughts? Well, I'd like to know who said it, if you have that. Oh, I wrote that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, uh, remember the scripture says, uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So uh, God is discoverable. Uh, all you have to do is look around and see the order in the universe, the order that is there, the, the natural laws, the physical laws. Uh, these have such precision and, and regularity and order to them that you're driven to the conclusion that they were created. There was an intelligence behind them. Uh, because it all fits so well. So um, I, 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 you know, I can understand why someone may be angry at the idea of being forced to follow rules that they didn't have any uh, hand in creating, but these moral rules were uh, created for our benefit, and they, they allow us to get along as uh, human beings they allow us to see the good and and choose the good over the evil uh, so these laws are not just some dictator imposing his will on us these laws are are in uh, intended to create a harmonious uh, happy uh, environment for us and if we follow them it'll do that all right Thank you. Julie, you want to take it over? Yep. I got a couple of questions. Uh, thank you. So we've distinguished between civil laws and, and natural law or civil rights and natural rights. Um, and it's pretty clear that, that things set up uh, in, in institutions of man are civil rights or civil laws. And then um, natural laws or natural rights are things that would be above any institution of man. But when we think about civil rights or civil law, should those things still not even be in recognition of natural law? And I would imagine that even the conception of a hard break between the two there would eventually lead to statements like Chris Cuomo's on TV um, of, you know, that rights come from man. So I wonder if, if we would think about, about even, even, um, measuring the bureaucratic process, which is completely just a civil government set up. It's not of God, it's of man necessarily, but even that would be recognizing the sovereignty of natural law. Uh, okay, so restate your question again. <laughs> so would even our civil rights, civil laws yes. need to be enacted in recognition of natural law? Well, that's exactly what Blackstone is saying. That and, and he's not the only one to have said it. There's many other quotations we could bring to bear on that. But all civil law needs to be in harmony with natural law. All civil rights uh, are, yes, as you said, are created by civil law, but that civil law needs to be in, in, uh, in harmony with natural law. And if it's not, as Blackstone says, if, there, if in fact, if it contradicts natural law, then that civil law is not to be regarded as a legitimate law. And you know, he doesn't come right out and say that we, could, uh, we can violate that law or ignore that law, but it means that we need to work as a people to bring our civil laws into harmony with natural law if, if there are some discontinuity. Yeah. And I definitely think that we've lost that, that we've lost that concept popularly that was widely accepted because, yes. because reason led, led thinking men at the time to recognize this, but now it's led us to another path. And I wonder with statements like Chris Cuomo's being able to say rights come from man, you know that, um, that is a fairly radical statement. And the repercussions of it are, are almost too much to talk about on, on the show because you'd have to, it would break down the, I mean, like the fiber of reality if you really consider where it leads to. And yet right. these statements are made so flippantly, constantly. Um, they're accepted in, in the secular world and schools everywhere. And my question is, without God, without natural law, there's really only chaos, but we never make people who say those things answer for that or answer the, the ideas that they also have to accept 
you know, mental distortions, things that if you told people, well, you know, that the end of this idea is this, they would say, well, no, I don't really believe that. Right. But we never can make anyone answer for it. I I guess I wonder how can we, a normal person who's not going to read a dissertation or read Aristotle or read even the founding fathers, but our ideas are dismissed with, you know, like sound bites. Right. I, I, I feel your pain, so to speak. I mean, I know where this is, this is headed. Uh, yes, if we leave all things to the measure of man, we are going to, we are headed for chaos. But the reason we have such a gulf right now between those few who believe in natural law and, and the many who do not is because the many were never taught that there is such a thing as natural law. I wasn't taught that there was natural law as I came up through public schools. I'm a product of project of uh, a product of public education. Uh, I certainly was not taught this as I came up in in uh, in through the grades. Uh, so we our, our first challenge is to get this information into the school system. Uh, private schools are probably teaching this to a much greater degree than than public schools, but we need to get once again control of our public school curriculum and introduce this concept. This isn't a sectarian concept. Natural law is something that can be discussed, sorry, by people from all backgrounds and all uh, religious or non-religious persuasions. It is it is simply a concept of how are we going to get along as human beings? How are we going to keep from from destroying ourselves? Well, we have to have a set of rules, a set of moral rules that govern all of us. And that's where natural law comes in. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that's our question. I think I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all are amazing. Y'all are amazing. This is so much fun. This is such a treat, isn't it? To sit around with the youth of America like this, the rising yep. generations. And- is this, is this not an exceptional experience? I have to say, and with a guest like you, Gary Porter, it's pretty, pretty. Well, Jewel ended up in the last question there talking about the founders and how this was a common view of the time. And I'm telling you, I just can't wait for next week's session to, uh, to dig into the founder's view because there's a lot more to it than we've been able to discuss today. Uh, so I hope mm-hmm. to, the, you know, I'm just looking forward to next week. <laughs> Well, join us next week and we'll bring, we'll bring your opinions and questions in, in the, in the chat when we get okay. to Kathy. I just want to say one thing in regard to kind of a, a, a summation of, of what everyone's asking and, and, and the opinions that are being, are being uh, uh, discussed here. And I, I think that obviously in our country, we have freedom of religion. So that includes if you want to be agnostic or atheist, and it doesn't make that person a bad person. Right. Uh, we, we have the freedom of religion here. I think the higher, the stair-stepping of, of, the, of, of reason here is just if human beings start being the barometer of goodness, um, we, that always leads to tyranny. And so it's a way, it's a preservation of of, um, of of a way of a way to to prevent that and and I think that in, in closing so I want to go to Kathy I, I think it's all we have to do and this is why history is so important is look at these communist societies or, or these societies with dictators what's the first thing they take away God your, your rights <laughs> the, the, well they take away God and then they take away your rights because right. if they get if they took away your rights and said there was there were a god, that would that wouldn't really work, right? So they take God away and then they take your rights away. I mean, they never it, it, religions are always have to go underground um, in places like this. And I I think that 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 proves the point of why we need um, why why we need why we need you know moral natural law. Okay, Kathy, go ahead. Well, thank you, Janine. Gary, in reading your essay that you wrote, and I hope that that everyone is able to go on the constitutionamerica.org website and read the essay, we can put the link into the uh, Q&A so that hopefully people will see it. But one of the 
really interesting points that you made that I had never realized till I read your essay is that it was actually a little controversial that Jefferson wrote that we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Hmm. Uh, you said a lot of people have written, they were surprised because at the time it would have been more expected that he would have put property instead of happiness. And can you talk a little bit about that, how, how pursuit of happiness is one of our natural rights? Well, uh, whole books have been written on this idea of where did Jefferson get the idea of pursuit of happiness. And as I mentioned in the essay, uh, the leading theory is that he, it came from his reading of uh, John Locke's uh, essay on an understanding of human or uh, explanation of human understanding. Uh, I've, I've forgotten the exact title, but in that in that essay, Locke talks about the pursuit of happiness. Uh, but he's, Locke wasn't the only one to use that phrase. Uh, others were using that phrase at the time. So Jefferson may have uh, latched onto that phrase from some other source. But the pursuit of happiness uh, to Jefferson's eye was leading a virtuous life, leading a virtuous life, leading a life where right choices are made, right choices will lead to happiness. So the pursuit of virtue is in fact the pursuit of happiness. And, and Jefferson was all about uh, uh, finding a virtuous life. Uh, he took the, um, the, the teachings of Jesus, for instance, and cut and pasted them into a separate document that he intended to give to an Indian chief. Here are some moral teachings, I think the best in the world, uh, for your education and understanding and, and, and to help you uh, lead your society, uh, O Indian chief. Uh, we call that Jefferson's Bible today, but it was really just moral teachings that he wanted to uh, spread to, to the Indians. So the pursuit of happiness, the general feeling is that uh, uh, Jefferson probably got the phrase from John Locke, but that he's talking about pursuing virtue as a way of achieving happiness. Also, I think it's so interesting if you say it that way, then what, what the declaration is saying is that, the, is that no one has the right to stop you from pursuing virtue. Correct. Absolutely. Great conclusion to that. Yes. That is a great conclusion. Now, Jonathan Weintraub in our audience asked an interesting question. What is the difference between human rights and natural rights? Okay, well, we have to be careful with our terminology because it, many people who are talking about human rights are in fact thinking of natural rights. Uh, and so it's very, care it's very important that people clarify their terms or if there's any confusion, you ask them, what, what do you mean by human rights? Are these inherent rights that are inherent to being human? If so, where did they come from? How did you know that they, these rights exist? Uh, that leads you into the, uh, the scripture which says, uh, you know, they have been embedded upon our conscience. So human rights uh, can be either. They can be natural rights or they can be inherent human rights that we human beings have created or acknowledge uh, among ourselves. So I think it's all tied up in, in how we define our terms. Natural rights, human rights can be natural rights. It just depends on how you define those, your terms. Okay. Now, uh, San, Sandy Thatcher asked uh, about Mar Matthew Stewart's book, Nature's God, uh, written by Norton in 2014. He says, shortlisted for the National Book Award argues that at least some of the founders like Ethan Allen and Thomas Young wanted to achieve freedom, not only from the British monarchy, but from supernatural religious superstition is what they call it as well. Hence held a view closer to Spinoza's pantheism than traditional Christianity. Are you familiar with that? And do you have a response to that? I'm not familiar with the book and neither have I studied in depth uh, Ethan Allen or the other uh, uh, founder. It's not a founder, but someone else in that period of time that he, she mentioned. Um, now, yes, there, there was uh, a, a thread you would could say of deism that was winding its way into America and, and import from Britain uh, that eventually even Thomas Jefferson played around with. And, uh, Benjamin Franklin in his autobiography says I he was a deist, although if you look at his uh, what he, he wrote, if you look at his prayer at the uh, Constitutional Convention, uh, clearly not the prayer of a deist. 
but um, but yeah, Ethan. I don't know what was in Ethan Allen's mind, and I've not read anything that uh, convinces me that he was trying to uh, gain independence from organized religion in any way. So I really can't comment. I I have not encountered those readings. Uh, I will say I've heard of Spinoza, Sandy Thatcher. He was in my Socrates to Sart book. Uh, okay. And, and pantheism, pantheism, uh, pantheism is still, it, it's all gods, I believe. Yeah, everything, we should look up. God, right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, so it's still, it's interesting. It's still, it's still talking about God, you know, oh, sure. the higher, higher being of, of sorts. Um, all right, go ahead, Kathy. Well, and I know you mentioned Ten Commandments in your opening comments, but Marjorie Emmer uh, asks, would the Ten Commandments be an example of natural law? Oh, perfectly so. Yes, they, uh, as Blackstone would say, if he was, if Blackstone was here among us and we could ask him this question, I'm sure he would respond by saying the Ten Commandments are kind of the leading edge of natural law that God pulled out of the the ink blot, if you will, or the darkness. Uh, and brought it into this revealed law category. The Ten Commandments obviously inscribed in stone by God himself and brought down from the mount. Um, they are natural law made revealed. And then finally, Lucia Lee Booth brings it back to modern day. And she says, this is where cancel culture has me very upset in 2021 seems to go against natural law. Do you have any comments on that? Well, cancel culture seems to go against a lot of things, <laughs> but certainly uh, the the uh, suppression of your speech and your beliefs. I mean, if you can be fired from your job for expressing a, a belief that uh, seems to run counter to what 51% of the people are saying, well, then we've reached a very dangerous point in our society. So uh, yeah, natural, you need to insist on natural rights. These are immutable, unchangeable, unalienable. And so they're going to be here today, tomorrow, and the next week. So you need to insist that they exist and that you have a right to express yourself without being, quote, canceled. And, you know, I was just going to say, it reminds me of a really uh, memorable moment, Janine, in 2010, when we went and interviewed the parents of all of our contest winners. And we had a young lady, Olga Zubashko, Zubashko, whose mother had immigrated here from Russia. And I remember Olga's mother saying that before she left the former Soviet Union, she was scared every morning because she said when she woke up, she didn't know what the law was going to be. If maybe the law had changed overnight, if her rights had changed and she might be arrested because for one day, one thing was legal and the next day it wasn't. And I, I think that's just such a great example of, of what happens when we when we get away from natural law. But I think someone else is gonna say something. I'll... Oh no, Zoba. do you mind if I just ask another question? Cause it just came up. Sure. Yeah, okay. yeah but that, that's really interesting, Kathy. And that, that made me think of a question I had, which is like, how do we determine what is natural law? And if we're going based off of the Christian Bible, how does that not violate, for example, the first amendment, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So how do we determine exactly what like God wants? And if we're going just based off of the Bible, like how does that not contradict the first amendment? Yeah, and Gary, before you answer that, I just wanna say, I think they're pretty, that's a good question, Tova. And, and I, I think they're pretty clear though, never to say Christian God in any of the documents. They never say that. No. They say creator, nature's law. They're, they're very careful. They're very careful, right? I mean, I know Washington, you know, reached out to, to, the, to the Jewish community. And, and I, 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 what do you think, Gary? I think they were pretty careful about that. I mean, you know, what's interesting, Tova, is I think different faiths respond to different natural law in different ways, right? Um, it's just a God, because God is going to want to have things be come from a place of hopefully enlightenment and love and goodness for all other people, but it doesn't have to be a specific God. And I think they were very, very careful about that. What do you think, Gary? Yeah, just what I was well, thinking, just to clarify my question, because I definitely agree with Janine. I wasn't saying that they were saying only the Christian God, you know, is natural law, but I'm just saying if different religions have different conceptions of God, for example, and one religion thinks 
here are the natural rights that God give us. And another religion says, these are the natural. How do we determine mm -hmm. as a country that can't respect the establishment of one singular religion? How do we determine what those natural rights are? Well, uh, without- This is the best. <laughs> My yeah. God's better than your God. <laughs> Uh, Blackstone's view, of course, was that the Ten Commandments, for instance, are a revealed law, a portion of natural law. Natural law without revealed law could only be discovered by reason. And that's what Locke says and others, that we have to use our reason. So if through using our reason, which the Bible says is flawed, flawed by the presence of sin, uh, if using our reason comes up to, with different conclusions as to what consists of uh, comprises natural law, then that's something that we have to work out as a people. We have to, we have to just sit down and reason together. Uh, because we've come to different conclusions. Uh, we have different religions. Let's sit down and reason together. Let's talk about this rationally. Let's compare why we believe what we believe. I mean, that's what it comes down to, working out our discrepancies or our differences as rational beings. Uh, and there's a way to do that. There's a way to, way to do that without fighting and, and destroying one another, uh, because we're all in, in, this, um, in this life for the common good. We're all trying to achieve the pursuit of happiness. So let's reason together. And then if there's, there's something lot, interesting it, about, about those questions, though, because we find that it's only that Western philosophy came from Christianity, Christian thinking. And it's only in Western philosophy that we find the concept of natural law the same way. And we find it in, um, we find it in, I did take one class about Confucius, <laughs> find it in, in Eastern philosophy, but it's a little different and it's not built. It's not, it's, it's not built the same way as far as ind individual, as far as the natural law being in the individual soul. So so it is, it is kind of hard to imagine natural law, which came from a conception of Western civilization. I would, uh, argue, I would argue that uh, all religions have a version of natural law. And if you look at Wikipedia's page on natural law, you'll see they actually take step by go step by step through uh the islamic view the christian view the taoist view the buddhist view and and so it's i think intriguing that other religions and other societies have commonly come up with the idea of that there is a natural law there is a natural order there are certain rules that i think we can all agree to in terms of how to get along as human beings Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I'd love to see that that breakdown on Wikipedia. I think that's that's really interesting. And Tova, you know, I, I talk about this a lot in in my God and goes, uh, but it, to me, it's also fascinating how in the Old Testament, how Moses um, with his father, when his father came, Jethro, wasn't it Jethro? I think Jethro is his father, um, and and Jethro uh, uh, arrived when Moses had taken everybody over, uh, across the Red Sea. And he was trying to be the judge for everyone. And everyone was coming to them with all their problems. And Moses was exhausted. And Jethro comes and says, what are you doing? You can't do this. You know, you can't be the man for everybody. So break it down into thousands, hundreds, you know, tens and whatever. And so they broke it down. So there were different judges in different districts. And, uh, and then there was sort of the Supreme Court, which was Moses. But what I love about that is that's how we are in our, in our you know, it, it really has rippled through our our legislative branch and our judicial system and how we have different judges and different courts and we have federal courts and you know state courts and all this that uh, it, I believe it was inspired from Moses and Jethro. I really really get a kick out of that. Did you have one more question, Tova, in closing, or Kathy? I was just wondering. Um, oh, I know we're out of time, but if you want to answer this, um, I don't want to keep you over. But if there is a law that we think goes against someone's natural law should it be um should it be followed just because it's from the state or should we resist against it or do we have an obligation to follow laws of the state even if we think it goes against natural law well that's, that's a, a great question excellent. that's a great question and uh, just know that uh 
almost 98% of the lawyers in this country as they go through law school are not taught about natural law. So, and those lawyers then become judges. So those judges, when you stand before them in court, don't know about natural law and, and they are unwilling, many of them to learn. Uh, when County Clerk Kim Davis was taken to court for uh, not uh, giving a marriage license uh, uh, after the Oberfell versus Hodges decision, uh, she asked the judge, can I, can I make my defense based on natural law? And that judge says, I can't allow that. That would be a dangerous thing to allow natural law to come into my courtroom. So you're going to encounter a lot of pushback, certainly in the legal system, if you try to introduce uh, a concept based on natural law. But that's not permanent. We can, we can re-educate our people. We can educate the American people about the value of natural law. And over time, we can see it come back into our society as it once was a prominent part of society. Mm. So they want the law to be set, established on precedent where men are the measure of all things. Exactly. And that's dangerous. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what a cool show. I just think this is this was stimulating and fantastic. And we got to continue this this um, Jewel and Jordan and Tova stepping in and kind of yeah, having a little more, more of an open mic situation uh, for the dialogue. I really enjoyed the way this this sort of evolved today. And Gary, you were you were terrific in answering all of our challenging questions from <laughs> Jewel and Jordan and Tova and our listeners and Kathy. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, terrific. Okay, well, Gary, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Gary. My, my pleasure. Once again, his article is at constitutingamerica.org in our 90-day study, 90 and 90 equals 180, history holds the key to the future, which it really does. Uh, well, I think we've really established today that if, if people really understood history and why laws and ideas formulated through the philosophers and the people like Blackstone and John Locke, I think that it's really a disservice to not teach this to our students, to not teach some of the classics. It's really a disservice. A disservice. Um, okay, thank you. To, uh, next week, uh, next week, Kathy, it's the founding fathers and uh, natural law. And Toba and Joel and Jordan, you might want to, and Aubrey, throw out a quick toss, even though we're late here, 30 second toss about the contest. We don't to talk about that anymore. Kathy, we want to thank, uh, we thank our sponsors again. And uh, to ne next week is the founding fathers and natural law. Go ahead, Kathy. Yes, we want to thank Dan and Ann Renzel again today for being the sponsors of this episode. Thank you so much, Dan and Ann. And Dan, thank you for serving on our leadership board. Thank you. Yes. Tova, who wants to talk about the contest? Oh, Tova's gone. Okay, Julian Jorn and Aubrey, quickly talk about the contest for two seconds. <laughs> yes, the contest is absolutely amazing because just by entering, you learn so much. And then you're able to see other contestants entries on depending on what you did on YouTube or anywhere else, you can just search it and you can see actually years of entries, depending on what you search, if you just put it in and you can see this organic wealth of knowledge built up and perspectives from the contests. So just enter it, number one. But number two, if you know anybody, if you're, you know, if you're thinking, if you have grandkids or you have um, nephews and nieces, tell them about this contest because the experience is amazing. Um, if you win, it is so cool. So it's great if, if you just do it, it's, it's a, it's a win-win no matter what, but if you win, the prize is something that they'll never forget. And it's really awesome. Great. Thank you, Jewel. Aubrey, I don't want to leave you out. I mean, he covered it, but yeah, it's a great learning experience too. You learn a lot by entering the cost contest. So even if you don't win, you gain more knowledge, which is always awesome. Jordan, I don't want to leave you out. You're our, one of our fabulous. Well, I'll well. say, you know, even if, uh, you know, maybe you have a brother that <laughs> you kind of just have to push in the back a little bit to go enter because you want him to write the paper. You still have a chance to go too, because there's a plus one. So, <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, no, but it's a Jordan came with me on the first, anyone doesn't know, Jordan came with me on the first time I won. Then the second time I entered, he entered too, and we both won. Yeah, because you're uh, it's just a great so opportunity, and, you know, you get to meet a lot of great people doing it. So I'd say go for yeah. it. 100%. Fun. Okay. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you guys. See you next Tuesday. Bye. See you then. Bye.